My name is Walter Strass, born on the 10th of October, 1924, in Steinbach am Klan, Germany. At that time, I was lucky that Hitler wasn't in power yet. Population of my little town was 800, no running water, but it had the only synagogue and cemetery for about 10 surrounding communities. Shortly after my birth, my parents moved to another town, Klan Münchweiler, which had a railroad station. And on Saturday, my parents were not Orthodox Jews, but on Saturday, better permitting, they would walk six miles to attend the school, the synagogue in Steinbach. My dad would carry me, either in his arms or in back. We got to the synagogue. The synagogue always was filled because they came Jewish people from all around. And my grandfather was the president of the synagogue. And after the synagogue, then we would go to his house, have meal, and like in, in Europe it was, people, Jewish people would get together. Then we would go home again. And then when Hitler came to power in 1933, my parents moved to Brücken, a town of about 3,000, where the people were wonderful to me. And at that time, life, things changed. I was, I was about two Jewish families all left, and only two children in school, Jewish kids. So there was a woman who said to my parents, I think it would be better if Walter goes to a big town, Mannheim, to go to school. So in about 1931 or 32, I moved to Mannheim, an orphanage. And that's where my life changed, because Hitler started already to, with his power. After my fifth grade, we couldn't go to a Jewish school anymore. So in Mannheim was one Jewish school, the K-2 school. I was lucky. For three years, I learned English for five hours every week. And I remember the Kristallnacht, very important. We were going to school. I call it, the, actually, the Kristallnacht, I call it the beginning of the Holocaust, because we saw on the streets the Jewish stores looted, the books burned, the late kids' windows broken in, Stein's damned Jews, killed the Jews. We got out of the school, and our principal said, kids, go home, something terrible is happening. We rushed back to the orphanage and looked behind the curtain of a three-story building, and about a half a block away, we saw a Jewish dentist, how he was arrested, his equipment thrown out of the street and smashed. I didn't know at that time what happened to my dad, but two days later, I got a mail, got mail from my parents that my father was taken to Dachau. And then, I just can't believe it because we were so scared. My parents were such, my mother told me that she has no means to, means to live. And she asked for welfare. The Germans said, we don't have welfare for the Jews. You have to make it, so it was terrible. But oh, about three months later, my dad was released from Dachau. And on the way back, he stopped by Mannheim to take me home because I couldn't finish school anymore under Hitler. I got home, and we were so poor, I had not even a suit. It's very important what I want to tell you. So I said to my dad, listen, I want to earn some money. He said, OK. And the Jewish people had to work for the German government. with hardly any pay. My dad and another Jewish man were among a group of 3,000 other people, not Jewish, building barracks for the German army because we lived close to the French border. So my dad said, Walter, I think I got a job for you. If you want to earn some money, I had no other chance. So my dad got up at 4 o'clock in the morning with me. We rode a bicycle to a railroad station, which we didn't have in our town. I worked for six hours, uh, for from 6 till 6 in the evening, 12 hours a day, for two months. Came home always at 10 o'clock at night. I made about roughly 27, 28 dollars or marks and to buy me suit. And on the 31st of August, 1909, we saw the German troops coming to our town, going to the French border. My dad and mom said, better go back to Mannheim, which was about 60 miles away because we were only about 20 miles from the French border. So, but I said to my parents, here, take the money. I went to Mannheim, 
and Nietzsche had nothing to do, so I worked for about two months in the Jewish cemetery as a gardener. And at that time, we tried to go out of Germany to Palestine. So we went near to Berlin. We had a whole group of boys on a collective farm, or you call it kibbutz. All of a sudden, now those farms were taken over by the Gestapo then. Actually, like labor came already. We were restricted, had a shoey star, you know, markings, couldn't move around. One day, we get a call that we would be replaced by people from the Ukraine, that we would go to the Eastern Front, they would come. So we knew there was something wrong. Why would they bring people from the Ukraine to Germany so we could trade places? And there came a call to assemble in Berlin. We were about, about 30 miles away from Berlin. We had prepared ourselves for the worst, like a Boy Scout. We took uh, medication along. We were a close group. I mean, we really were prepared. And we were assembled in Berlin. It was a big place. I don't know what uh, the Fassadenstraße, the name. I don't know what the synagogue was. We were about 1,000 people, Jewish people, old, young parents, children. And so said, we took everything along. One day to come, it was just the beginning of April, came the call to go. We went, we had to march to the railroad train, and they all freight cars. Were there uh, any family members with you? No, I was time? alone. Regular freight cars. They're much smaller than the United States. The reason I said, because we were crowded in it. And every so often, it was a regular passenger car for the guards to watch it. We drove off, we took everything along. They told us to take everything along. It took us about two days. When we got to Auschwitz, we could tell it was Poland because of the kind of name of the cities, you know, on the town. Unbelievable. When we got to Auschwitz, leave everything in the freight cars, you get everything back as soon as you get out of the cars. And actually, we didn't know at that time really what was happening. And it went so fast. The, the worst thing was for the older people or weak people, when they couldn't just jump fast enough out of the, the truck, you know, they beat them up. And I can't remember how it was left or right. There is a question if the one put the left or the right. But we were selected. And from the 1,000 people which came, 700 were taken right away. away. We knew they were gassed later, we found out. And what they were looking for, they were looking for strong people, not too old, not too young, because all they needed was for work. Now, there were three main camps, Auschwitz number one, Auschwitz number two is Birkenau, where the gas chamber was in the ovens. And Auschwitz number three, which I went to, Buna. This is a very big place. We built a synthetic rubber plant by the IG Farben, which was the biggest chemical concern in Germany at that time. And so we knew they needed us for work. And I remembered we were, when we were loaded on trucks, crowded, and the uh, SS with motorcycles with the gun storm behind us. And it was really, the, the fear started on us because now we didn't know what happened. We knew before already that they tried to kill people, but we didn't know what would happen. We didn't know what happened to the other seven nine people. We said they would take me away only later on. So when we got to the, to Buna, to the camp itself, the first thing we were taking in a big place, a room where they took our clothes off shaved our hair over the whole body, took naphtha to wash it up, you know, and then they gave us some prisoner clothes. Then we had to run about 50 feet away. It was a tent. It was very cold. It was April, April the 10th, 1943. And as soon as we came in the tent, we had to line up, and there was a prisoner. I remember the little prisoner bought some friends, was a Jewish prisoner. He, his only job he had to do was to tattoo the prisoners. See, and that, that was painful. That prisoner, that was the only job he had to do, tattoo a thousand of prisoners. And that was like a pen with a needle and ink. It was very painful. As soon as he had tattooed, then we took our clothes, and then we got an order 
where we would go on a block, the barracks, terrible, overcrowded, sanitary condition, you know? and those guys which were in charge, block elders, uh, but they called students, it's the guy we had to clean the, the room. They were very hard on us. If one of the prisoners, we, we were prisoners now, we, well, in fact, they beat you. That was unusual, not unusual to beat you up, you know. And then we were assigned to the carts, you know, like a bunk, all wooden plank with some straw on it, three, uh, three layers. I was on top, you see, because I was young, I could go up there. We had a terrible condition. Then in the, the only thing we had, the main food was bread. Uh, I, I remember we got one pound of bread. It was for breakfast, for lunch, and for supper. Then uh, at noon we got soup, mostly soups, and turnips and stuff like this. But the worst thing was, in the morning you got up very early, and then you had to go to a roll call. It was in the center of the camp. It was a big place where we had to stay at attention. And they checked us out, each prisoner. You know, each block was separated. Number so and so, you, you had no name anymore, just a number. Number so and so, and it goes on. And we stood sometimes for an hour. And the next prisoner fell, was weak, fell over. They took me away. Then we had to walk to work. And when you got to a concentration camp, you usually got the hardest job there could be. The first job I had was a cable commander. Like here, when the power, com power company puts cable down, done by machine. It was done by us. Now, one thing I want to bring out, we had to walk so many prisoners in a row and at a certain pace. And next to us was always the guards with, with the guns. And like I mentioned before, if we didn't like that guy, he took the cap. We had to have a cap on, you know, prisoner guard. I took the cap and threw it away. The prisoner had to get retrieved the cap he stepped out and he shot him and killed him. We were a fair game. That was a game for them, to kill. And it was unbelievable, you know, the condition. Now, one thing, we had wooden shoes. I bring up by wooden shoes that was very, uh, in one way it was good. The, the soles were wooden and part of it was material. Because when you walk, it, they insulate you a little bit. So in wind and weather, when it was cold, it helped you a little bit to insulate. And we worked. So when we got to the work detail, then we had uh, picks and shovels. We had to dig out big deals, you know, and then lay the cables. But the worst thing was, those cables were heavy. And let's say every 10 feet was another prisoner. If one prisoner fell, you had a double load. Then we laid the cables, covered it up, and when we were finished, we went back to, work, to the barracks, you know. Terrible because we got to the deal, hardly anything to eat, soups again. And then they said, uh, like I say, sanitary condition, we had no soap, nothing. The way I brushed my teeth, I took my finger, water, and brushed my teeth this way. Can you imagine? In fact, I had a dentist not long ago, he said, how come your gums are still all right yet? Because a lot of our prisoners had troubles. And so, the worst thing happened, if you could, in the first six weeks, many of our prisoners died again because they couldn't take it. I got sick, I don't know how many weeks later, had severe diarrhea, high fever. And we were afraid to go in the hospital, but they called Krankenbar. Because we knew already, if you stayed longer than two weeks in the hospital part, they would take you away to the ovens. There's an interesting story. I got in the hospital, and our group was very well known because we stuck together. And I got in the hospital, and the man said to me, the, 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 the male, all male nurses, you know, the guy was a, his name was Siki Halbreis, the reason I bring it up. He was a pharmacist from profession, from Katowice or Kleibitz. But he was a leader of the Maccabi at the year organization I used to belong to. He said, Walter, don't worry. So every two weeks they took my name off the list, 
changed the room, and after six weeks, I got a job at the hospital. But how important it was, because that saved my life. Other people died when they got sick. In my case, it reversed. I, I'm alive. Because when you were able to work inside, that was 75% of your life, at least. Not only this, we didn't have to go to cold call. Very important. Also, we had a little bit better place to, in the hospital itself, to eat more food. But most important was I got a tremendous job there. I became in charge of the disinfection, where all the new prisoners came in, the civilians, where we took the clothes off. They were shaved like what I went through when I came in here. And I disinfected the clothes, not only from the newcomers, but also from the prisoners in the camp. And there is where my deal, because I was at that time the only German-speaking person in this uh, department. And the SS man, his name was Neubert. He liked me. And so I was able to help the old-time prisoners. So then came an order, it was about the middle of January, that we would have to evacuate Auschwitz. The Germans didn't want us to fall in the hand of the, the Russians. And there is a tremendous hardship on them, because we had to walk, I know, for many hours to the, to the railroad station. And there was open freight cars in Winnaka, tremendous cold, so crowded you couldn't believe it. I don't know exactly at this time how many thousand prisoners we were. Let me just give a rough estimate, three and a half thousand, four thousand. In five days, 75% of the prisoners died. What we did, when the prisoners next to you died, fell over, we took his clothes off, put the clothes on for us, and threw the prisoner overboard. This was very well documented after the war. The only water we had was the snow. Do you know what it means, sanitary condition? You couldn't believe it. Because we had no control over nothing, you know? And then uh, we, it took us five days from Auschwitz to come to Buchmann because there was, the railroad didn't run because still war, war going on. And I remember about after three days we came to Prague. Something unusual happened. It looks like today I see it. There was a railroad bridge go where, where we were down and check civilians threw food in our train. That's also when we get the first time f to eat after s s in five days, one meal, was soup and maybe some potatoes, and some a slice of bread. Then the train started up again, we came to Buchwald. Now, when they liquidated Auschwitz, not all prisoners went to Buchwald. They took them to different concentration camps in Germany. And I was lucky in one way again. Now, we got to Buchwald, the same deal started up again. You had to stand, the same routine. Shame, watching, you know. And at that time, Buchenwald was so overcrowded. Unbelievable. We laid on wooden planks, like I mentioned before. But we could not lay on our back. No room. We had to lay on the side. Like, like this, you know. We woke up in the morning, the next guy what to knew was dead. It was only short term in Buchenwald. They said, Walter, we tried to save you. They went about to the other camp, Altenburg. When I got to that Altenburg, we made ammunition for the German Air Force. The name of the burg was Hassackburger. No electric fence, just barbed wire. And the buildings were no barracks, were factory buildings. And the guards were not the right guards anymore. And there was a chance of an escape. There was the guy in charge of us men was, his name was Jakob Ehr. He was from Vienna. He was uh, already six years in the concentration camp. And he, I know how it was, he talked to that girl, I remember the name Fritsche. She was in the 20s, and he said about the escape. And she, uh, she agreed. When the transport, she will make the arrangements. So what happened is, unusual. I found out later, on the 11th of April, 45, Buchenwald was liberated. We marched off from Altenburg on the 12th of April. Now, the unusual thing happened. The 3,000 women and 78 men walked 
in the wrong direction and coincidentally run into the American army. We are liberated on the same day. And Jakob Ehr, me, this SS girl and three old soldiers, uh, guards, we are on the truck with the food. There were about three trucks, you know. We had salami and bread and stuff like this. And then there was an air raid. An air attack on the transport. And everyone would go in shelters. We were in a little town, but we walked off. Now this SS girl, we had arranged that she had a suitcase with civil clothes. We told her, don't change clothes until we let you know. And because it was in Germany, uh, we had civil clothes on. Had, my hair had a little bit grown. We never bared our arms or the number. We never took a cap off. Can you imagine it? So the first two days or three days, we went to the farmhouse. They believed us. Because there was chaos going on. We had a, they were very nice, the Germans. Then for about two days, we slept in the forest. And there something unusually happened. About 100 yards away was a, a road. And we saw all of some dogs barking and German soldiers. Again, luck. The wind was in our favor. They didn't catch us. We had to be laid down a pine forest. It was cold. We had, no, we had nothing to cover us up, the three of us. So then, again, we slept in farmhouses, you know. And on the 21st of April, and something unusual happened. About a half mile away, we saw an isolated farmhouse with an American tank. We walked straight to that American tank, took our cap off, raised our arms and said, don't shoot, we are prisoners from the country. I could speak, I told you, I could speak English. We were interrogated for a long time. You cannot imagine, at first to be a human being again, to sleep in a real bed after so many years on wooden planks. All the hardship to feel free, you know, have a decent meal. You had to be very careful with eating too at that time. They told us, don't eat too much because many people got really kills himself by, you know, this is unusual, you know, we have not to eat for years. After you escaped from Altenburg, yeah, yeah. you made your way back home, is that correct? Yeah, I tell you what this. At that time, uh, you got an ID card. You know, the, there was still a war going on. So what happened is when I had escaped, I was free on the 22nd of April, 45. Then I had a paper from the American army from the 25th of April, 1945, and they write that I was thoroughly investigated by the counter in Kerensenkorf, the 6th Army Division, but, and that I would be of value for the Senate investigation in Buchenwald, what happened in the concentration camp. So when I went to Buchenwald, then I got my ID card, where it shows born and so on, and the date I went to the Auschwitz, 10th of April, 43, and the last day of freedom was May 45, really. So then when we assembled in Buchenwald, they tried to get a group of people, to prisoners together from different parts of Germany. So I have a picture, there were about, oh, must be about 20 or 25 former prisoners, you know, of which I'm the youngest. So then we went by, by I think it was by trucks that time, that's part of Germany. Now remember, uh, where I come from West Germany, close to the French border. And we came to a little place which is known, very known today, but it's a Rammstein Air Base, a lunch stool. Sometimes we see when they take prisoners, uh, uh, sick soldiers, in just to Germany for treatment, lunch stool. And there was a family, a butcher, very well known to, friend to my parents, and they bought us some bicycles. We had two guys. One guy's name was Ludwig Moses, who was with me in Buchenwald, and me. I went back to Brücken, and uh, Ludwig Moses went to Glanminch, the place where we lived. He rode with a bicycle. I never forget. At that time, I had gotten from the American Army a leather coat from an assessment, a black leather coat, you know. Rode a bicycle, come to the little to my little town home, but 
I told you about diamond cutters and polisher. And the name was Tauber, family Tauber, close friend from my family. I think the woman's name was Berta. The husband died. I knocked on the door, and she looked out of the window and said, who are you? I said, you don't remember me? You don't recognize me? She said, no, who are you? I said, it's Walter, Walter Strass. You couldn't believe it. That went around like fire. The whole population knew right away what's going on. Walter's back. They came. What happened? What happened your parents, you know? Unusual. That's each one would invite me. You know, come on, you gotta have this and this. So at that time, uh, there was a butcher, Leichner was his name. He was the mayor. Now, he was not a Nazi, he was a little bit dumb anyhow, but he was mayor at that time, you know, because they got rid of the Nazi, real Nazi mayors. So I stayed with him. It was very good. I had to feed, I had food and everything. He also had two American soldiers uh, stayed with him because they would, some of the soldiers would sleep off the base. But coming back, what happened then, so this was on the French occupation, I mentioned it before. And when they told the county executive to put me in charge of the city hall, and I found the list of the 3,000 citizens, only 20 and lots of men. And what they had to do every Saturday for me? At first, the first thing I did, the center was here, ye, there used to be a, a town crier. I know how it was here, the old time. They would go around with the bell, you know, and give Bekanntmachung, they said Bekanntmachung. What's new and do what's going on, what is this and this, terrible organization, church or not. And I made an announcement on Saturday at this and this time, all Nazi men by the list have to appear in front of the city. And I had done the following. I had, I remember today, standing in front of the step where the, I, a lot of the citizens came by and they were all the Nazi. And I told them off. I held a speech. You know, I was young, 21 and a half years, full of pepper, three again. And then every Saturday, they had to clean the streets, the sewers. But something unusual happened. I knew the guy who was the leader, the real Nazi boss, his name was Young. I called him to my office. Miley was in there, I said to him, Mr. Young, Herr Young, I said, don't you think you were responsible for the death of my people, my parents? He said, no. I said, what do you say? You're a full-fledged Hitler. I hit him. True story, he fell on the floor. He raised his hand and said, if you raise your hand, I'm going to kill you. I never would have killed him. But I was so, I mean, I really was fiery. But what happened is, after I talked to those I had those guys working, and I had a lot of friends, you know, how youngster I remember. I was, listen, I have to bring the humor in. The first Christmas, I went to a Catholic church for midnight mass. The first in the year, you couldn't believe what happened to me. I never was strong. We were about four or five boys and girls. We went, we, kids I grew up with, you know, and from nice family, we were friends. So it was 11.30, unusual, but him. I wanted to get drunk. So I said, I'd like to drink beer, wine, and whiskey. At 12 o'clock, I was drunk. And uh, they told me later on, I was talking about the concentration camp. They got so scared. The stories I told them, I don't know how long I talked. Fell asleep, and the next morning, I, was, I had no hangover whatsoever. But what happened is when I had done those with the Nazis, one time I was from a little town, I was a little bit, had a little party, came home, I saw they were waiting for me. The Nazis tried to do something for me. So I was able to get in the deal, and that's when I decided I'd go away. Anyhow, I was in a French zone, I wanted to go to Palestine at that time. It was not Israel, I went to the American zone. That where I went on the kibbutz, collective farm. And I really a true story. I was so young. I was a political analysis at that time already. In, you know, we had uh, programs in the kibbutz at that time. You know a bit about it? No, the kibbutz, you know, we talk about 
daily happenings, we learn keyboards at time, which I forgot to have already. We work farming, see? And, uh, but I didn't go to Israel because uh, I had my sister in the United States, I got married. My wife didn't go to Boston, so I came to Kansas City. 